Great. Well, yeah, we are continuing this series on a section of the book of Acts. We have titled this series, Devoted, the Markers of a Spirit-Filled Church. And we're exploring what these first disciples devoted themselves to after they had this powerful encounter with the Spirit at Pentecost. And so last week we explored their devotion, their desire to follow Christ and pursue discipleship. And today, as we continue in this text, we're going to explore their devotion to, or their commitment to, generosity. As they encountered the power and the provision of God, it led to a reorientation of their relationship to money and possessions, and it unleashed uh, just a radical generosity towards those in need. And I want to explore how God might cultivate a generous spirit within us as well. As we get into this topic, I just want to begin by acknowledging that this is kind of a sensitive topic, and some of us probably come carrying uh, some anxiety and stress around money, and uh, some of us have maybe had some hard experiences related to money in the context of church, and so maybe we encountered some scenarios where uh, money wasn't handled well, or where we encountered some annoyingly aggressive fundraising tactics that left a bad taste in our mouth, right? So I think I just want to name that as we come into this, uh, this conversation that sometimes we feel a little bit of resistance or uh, it, it just brings up some stuff for us. And so I want to name that and just offer a couple preliminary thoughts as we uh, hopefully can just open our hearts up to what God might want to say to us through this text. And the first thing I just want to say is that, you know, at BCC, we're not a church that talks about money all the time. Uh, But we are going to be a church that talks about it sometimes simply because it just keeps coming up in Scripture. And so if we are faithfully preaching the Scripture, we're going to bump into this theme from time to time. And it's actually surprising how often Jesus engages this theme about money and our relationship to wealth. It comes up actually a lot more than many other issues or topics that you would think would be more prominent in the Scriptures. And I think there's a couple of reasons why Jesus and the, the... writers of scripture engage this theme regularly. And I think a big thing is Jesus recognizes that money and wealth can become a very central and controlling idol in our life. Uh, This is something that can actually be the main source of our devotion. Last week we noticed Jesus' comment in Matthew 6 that there's often this battle between our devotion to the possessions and mammon, the things of this world, and our devotion to God, and we often have a divided heart. The other thing that I think is a reason why Jesus engages this theme often is that we can easily cloak greed or an unhealthy attachment to money as something that is virtuous. This is one of those real slippery vices that we can easily justify as a virtuous thing. And so Richard Foster, in his book on the spiritual disciplines, write this, covetousness we call ambition, hoarding we call prudence, and greed we call industry. Right? This is, uh, it, it's sometimes hard to discover where we cross that line from good financial stewardship to kind of an unhealthy attachment or greed. And I think that's why Jesus has to talk about this often, because it flies under the radar. It's kind of a slippery one, right? And so, so we, are, we talk about it because it comes up in Scripture often. Uh, the second just preliminary comment, I want a little caveat before we jump into this conversation, is I want to just acknowledge that we are not starting from scratch here as a congregation. We are building on a conversation that I think we've already had and many of you have been involved in. I just want to acknowledge that you are a generous congregation. And I know many of you have lived into this vision of radical generosity, and I thank you for your faithfulness and uh, just recognize that we're, we're building on a, a trajectory that's already part of the DNA of this congregation. So I recognize that I'm going to be preaching to the choir a little bit today. <laughs> Uh, but I think that even the choir needs to be preached to once in a while on this theme because this culture of generosity that many of us have bought into is really countercultural. And we are swimming upstream. We live in a culture that is forming us with a counter narrative, a narrative that says more is better. We live in a culture that has normalized excess. 
And so in, in America, we make up 5% of the world's population. We consume 26% of the world's goods. Right? So that, that's just the, the waters we're swimming in right now. And we are day in and day out formed by a different narrative. There is a multi-billion dollar advertising industry whose sole purpose is to make us feel discontent and to sell us on this narrative that we need more. Right? And so that's why I think we just need to recalibrate regularly around this teaching about generosity. And I believe that, that Jesus desires that we might experience a, a redeemed and re, a, a beautiful relationship to how what we've been given can be used for the common good and ultimately for our good as well. All right, there's the caveats. Let's dive in. <laughs> All right, what I want to do today is I, I want to organize our thoughts around three questions. I want to pose three questions to this text. We're going to look at how uh, we can develop generosity, especially since it is a countercultural reflex. Uh, the second thing I, I'm going to ask is this what question. What does it actually mean? What is the New Testament asking of us in regards to generosity? And last, we're going to ask why. So why does Jesus invite us into this practice? We're going to be covering quite a bit of ground, and I just want to remind you, we've started up our sermon response guides. You can find it on our homepage. They're also out on the Next Step kiosk, so there's going to be a lot of quotes. Don't feel like you've got to write it all down. Be, uh, just point you in that direction if you want to revisit some of the things we're going to be talking to. So first, I, I want to just engage this question of how, how do we cultivate generosity in a world that, that teaches us uh, to pursue a different relationship to our possessions. Last week, we zeroed in on the word devoted in Acts chapter 2. We noticed that these first disciples were devoted to following Christ, and to discipleship, and to generosity. And it's a really significant word. It implies that these practices that we're focusing on were not motivated by guilt, or by ego, or selfish ambition, but it was uh, the outflow of a reoriented heart. They had a desire to follow God. And that similarly applies to this practice of generosity. This was not the result of guilt. This wasn't the result of arm twisting or manipulative fundraising appeals, right? There was just this uh, reorientation of what they were living for that flowed out of their encounter with Christ. As they encountered the power of God, the provision, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the purpose they found in Christ, it, it reoriented, it recalibrated what they lived for, and generosity flowed out of that. In Acts 4, there's a very similar passage to our passage in Acts 2. And I want to read this. It just kind of expands on this picture of generosity in the early church. Acts 4, 31 to 34, we read, After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And all the believers were of one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. And with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. We notice in verse 31 of this passage the context of generosity. This flowed out of their encounter with God. The place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and generosity flowed from that. Right? Now, I want to just uh, observe an interesting detail about when they met for prayer, the place that they met was shaken. This detail was not just included for dramatic effect. <laughs> it's, it's interesting that throughout Scripture, there are many times when God shows up and things begin to shake. We see this in Act, uh, Exodus 19 when God comes powerfully upon Mount Sinai and this huge, large mountain begins to shake. We see this after the resurrection, or sorry, after the death of Jesus, where an earthquake erupts. When God shows up, sometimes the things of this world begin to be a little bit shaky. And the writer of Hebrews indicates what, what, uh, what's happening in this scene. 
I don't have this on the slide, so I'm going to just read this for you. This is from Hebrews 12. The writer suggests that the purpose of these experiences is to indicate, this is Hebrews 12, indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that can be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God. Here's the point I want to make. In the presence of God, the things that look solid and powerful, like mountains, are suddenly shaky and weak. In the presence of God, the various idols of this world that we have put our trust in, that have our heart, suddenly seem less appealing and less powerful. Generosity emerges when the shaky foundation of treasure and wealth is exposed. Generosity emerges when we realize that it is not in our best interest to store up for ourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, where stock markets crash, where discontent persists, where U-Hauls will never follow hearses to the graveyard. And I wonder if we just need to be shaken up a little bit. I wonder if the Spirit wants to just shake up that hard attachment that wealth and possessions has, that that needs to be dislodged in our hearts as we have a fresh realization of the true power and provision that comes from God. To discover that we have a more firmer foundation by which we build our lives, a much more beautiful vision to attach our lives to an unshakable kingdom that is our inheritance. Friends, I believe that the reorientation in our heart is the, the starting point in this conversation. Our ability to let go of our attachment to the things of this world begins when we attach ourselves to the firm foundation of Jesus and this unshakable kingdom. And I just hope that God might actually do some of that work among us today as we pray, that we might reorient, recalibrate our heart and put our hope in what really matters. The first disciples encounter, their encounter with the power and provision of God leads them to practice a radical generosity. They didn't consider property their own. They sold extra property, gave it to those in need, and as a result, there were no needy among them. There were no needy among them. Which leads us really into to the second question of what does actually generosity look like? What is God asking of us? What is the call in this passage in the New Testament? Should we now go home and sell all our homes and, and give it all away? Is that the call? What do we do with that? Is there a certain percentage that we're called to give? How do we know if we're being faithful? I just want to get practical for a moment as we look at this New Testament teaching. Now, there are times in the New Testament when God does call individuals to voluntary poverty, to radical dispossession of wealth. We think, for example, of the rich young ruler who was asked to dispossess himself of his wealth, give it all to the poor. And I want to be open to the fact that God might have a, a big call for some of us in, the regard, in that regard. But I also acknowledge that the broader teaching of the New Testament doesn't make that normative for everyone. Even here in Acts 2, we notice that the selling of possessions and property wasn't a requirement. It was a voluntary offering as there was need. In Acts 4.35, it happened from time to time, not all the time. We see later in our text that there's still people meeting in their homes, which suggests that some people held on to private property. So we don't have sort of this primitive form of mandatory communism in the church where everyone is required to dispossess themselves of everything. Right? But what we do have is a picture of a very radical, sacrificial generosity. The disciples gave in a way that was costly to them, They put the needs of others before their own, and though they held on to some possessions, they did not see them as belonging to themselves, but they belonged to God. They belonged to others. And I think that's the general call in this text. It's this call to a radical generosity 
In the Acts 4 passage, there is an echo back to Deuteronomy 15. This phrase, there was no needy among them, is a fulfillment of the call in Deuteronomy 15.4, where God says, there shall be no poor among you. And what we see in the book of Acts is this new movement is fulfilling that call. And it's actually set in contrast to the temple institution, which was failing in that call. And so there's something very subversive being communicated here. And when you go back to Deuteronomy 15, we have this first introduction into this idea of tithing, where they, the Israelite people tithe 10% of their resources to the Levite, to the stranger, the poor, and the widow. And so the New Testament really sees the early churches fulfilling that vision, living into that vision. Now, throughout uh, the New Testament, there isn't this consistent legalistic expectation, this is the amount that you are to give, but there is an expectation that we would live into this vision and that there would be this call to radical generosity. And so John Stott suggests this. Already in the Old Testament, there was a strong tradition of care for the poor. The, uh, the Israelites would give a tenth of their produce to the Levite, the alien, the fatherless, and the widow. How can spirit-filled believers possibly give less? <laughs> Just a thought, right? As a baseline, as we kind of try and discern what God's call is in Scripture. Here's a more challenging one. <laughs> And this is a thought from C.S. Lewis I think I've shared before. I come back to this from time to time. And he says, I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. If our giving habits do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they are too small. There ought to be things we want to do but cannot do because our giving expenditures exclude them. So the picture here, friends, is not an afterthought of generosity, but a very radical and central generosity. And I just wonder, as we listen to the Spirit of God today, what God is asking of us. I think that's something we ought to circle back to from time to time. What does generosity look like for us? And it's going to look different in different seasons of life. This doesn't just apply to finances. This applies to our time and the ways we open homes. Sometimes the harder, costly call might be through action, not just writing a check. We have different capacities. But I just want us to be open. And I've been just sitting with the Spirit of God, just allowing this hard conviction to be at working in my heart today. What is God asking of us? I wonder if that's something we need to circle back to and reevaluate from time to time. Well, I want to leave us with this last question about why, why are we even having this conversation? Why are we called into this practice? What is the invitation here? I want to remind us, friends, that God does not call us to spiritual practices for arbitrary reasons. God's goal is not to make our life miserable, right? We remember in John 10 that God, that Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and life abundantly. There is a way that seems right to us and right to our world, but when we follow that trajectory, we, we see that it leads to the harm of those in need and it eats away at our soul and we're caught in cycles of discontent. Can we see God's vision as we reflect on his call to generosity. And I just want to share a couple of reasons why I think God is inviting us into this practice. And the first thing we see in our text that's very clear is that God calls us to generosity because God cares for the poor and the vulnerable. This is what drove the ethic of generosity in the Mosaic Law. And Jesus continues this call in the New Testament. It grieves God's heart that there are some of us that have way too much and some of us who do not even have the basic necessities of nutrition and shelter. And as Christ followers, uh, this is part of our call to respond to that great disparity. And I just lament fact, the fact, friends, that we cannot say in integrity that there are no needy among us. There are many needy among us. In his book, uh, The Hole in Our Gospel, Richard Stearns the former president of World Vision argues that 10% of every American churchgoer's income could literally change the world <laughs> if we were consistent in this practice and stewarded this well. On average, we give about 2.5%, and churches give about 2% of that 
to world relief type ministries. So there's a challenge to both institutions and individuals in this. And he does a little math experiment. It says if we just kind of all went up to that amount and steward things right, we could eliminate extreme poverty for over a billion people in this world in like a couple years, right? It's amazing what could happen if we collectively responded to this call. And I think part of the, the, the reason why we neglect this call is maybe sometimes we are isolated from the needy. They are not among us. I wonder if we need to come into more proximity. It was great. I don't know if Tim and Christine are here. I just got to check in with them. They just got back from Tanzania and, and the school that we've been supporting, some of their work in, in, with the Maasai community. And it just, like, burst my affluent middle-class bubble, that conversation. I need more of those conversations where they just shared stories of people, friends that they know that are meeting in a church on a dirt floor barely enough to get by. And I wonder if we just need to have more proximity to these stories because we're isolated from it. God desires, I believe, that we would be part of this good news for the poor, the oppressed, and the broken. That's why we're called to this. In the midst of that, I think we are also called, in the midst of our response to direct relief for the poor, to the call of investing in this ongoing work of discipleship and formation as a church. We see in the New Testament church that their generosity both funded direct relief to the poor and also to the work of, of creating formative communities. And so in 1 Corinthians 9, 14, they, they supported those who would devote themselves to the teaching of the Word and to forming local church communities. I had a really interesting conversation with a friend who's part of a healthcare foundation and uh, just commented about how a number of secular nonprofits are lamenting the decline of church attendance. Turns out that church wasn't so bad after all. <laughs> and what the, the research is showing, even in secular philanthropy research, is that the decline of church attendance is impacting generosity across the board. And, and what some of these secular nonprofits are noticing is that there's not very many other communities that are forming people for the common good, that are forming people to love their neighbor and to be generous. And so it was a renewed invitation to me to, to realize that what we are doing here also matters, and that as we seek to respond to God's call, we need to balance a number of ministry fronts. Yes, we need to be doing direct relief work, but we also need to do the work of discipleship that's going to be this engine that will drive and form us to actually start nonprofits and, and engage in our communities. I shared a few months back, a, a metaphor in one of our newsletter articles, and maybe like 10% of you read those, so I'm going to work this into the sermon. <laughs> it's a, it's a well-known metaphor about a group of people that go down to a river, and they see someone drowning, and they respond with compassion. They go and they pull this person out, and then they see another person drowning, and so they go in and make another rescue. But then there's another person, another person, they're just going in and out rescuing people, and they continue this work of providing relief to those in distress. But as this continues to happen, a couple of people in the group say, hey, some of us should actually walk upstream and figure out what's causing all these people to drown in the first place. So some people stay and they continue the work of relief, but other people walk upstream to do the work of development and justice and create a context where people aren't drowning anymore. And I think this is just a really helpful metaphor as we discern where God is calling us to give. We need to give to direct relief work. And we're doing a lot of that as a church. as We work with World Relief, right? And other uh, nonprofits that are on the ground. That's part of our call. But part of our call is also to walk upstream and, and to be doing that more deeper development work where we're forming a community that's actually going to jump into the water to begin with. And so I invite you to discern with us how we support these different ministry friends. It's interesting, in Deuteronomy, they're giving to the poor, the widow, the orphan, but also to the Levites that are forming the temple worship community. And I just, honestly, I just have wrestled with this. I remember I had an experience down in Longview where I was working at a low-barrier shelter and just seeing all this 
trauma. And after my volunteership, I, I went to my office to start writing a sermon, and I thought, God, is this even, like, what should I be doing? <laughs> Why am I spending time studying the scriptures when there are people literally dying on the streets? And I've just been reminded, and through my prayer and discernment, God telling me that discipleship still matters in a word of, world of pain. We need both. <laughs> it's a both-and conversation. The last thing I just want to say is we answer this why question. Why is God inviting us into this work? It is good for the poor. It continues this important work of discipleship. But ultimately, too, friends, it is good for us. In Luke chapter 12, uh, Jesus tells this parable of the barn builder. He's just building up more and more stuff. And it's interesting that text is all about him. I'm going to build my barns and enjoy my life. And it seems like nobody else is in the picture. He's curved in on himself. And Jesus comments on this disciple, and, and, and he says this, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. That is not where life consists and exists. I believe God wants to free us from a life curved in on ourselves, <laughs> that we get to be part of investing in something that will be unshakable, a kingdom that will endure forever, that we get to be part of this beautiful work of bringing good news to a world. And my friends, I invite you into that vision, and I invite the Spirit to come upon us, even here and now, to shake us up a bit and invite us to discern where we too are called to live a life of generosity for the glory of God and for the good of our neighbors. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious God, as we continue in worship, I pray that you would be at work among us. Would you do some healing work in our hearts, maybe dislodge some unhealthy attachments we have? Give us clarity as to what you are asking of us, how you want to use us to bring good news to the poor. So, Lord, we invite your spirit to come upon this place in this time of response to do your work among us. Friends, would you join me in this prayer that you'll see on the screens? Gracious God, everything we have comes from you. You fill us with good things. Our hearts and lives overflow with your abundance. With thanksgiving, we bring to you our time our talents, our tithes. Use these gifts that you have given us to feed others as we have been fed, to serve others as we have been served, and to bless others as we have been blessed through Jesus Christ our Lord.